Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar, Evolution of Clinical Evidence of the Blood-Based Notify Lung Nodule Risk Assessment. My name is Robbie Lunt, and I'm the Director of Marketing at Biodesix, and I am joined today by two of the foremost experts in lung nodule management, Dr. Gerard Silvestri and Dr. Susan Garwood. Dr. Silvestri is the Hillenbrand Professor of Thoracic Oncology at the Medical University of South Carolina and author of over 200 scientific articles, book chapters, and editorials, and currently serves on the editorial board of CHEST following his appointment as president of the American College of CHEST Physicians in 2017. Dr. Silvestri was also the principal investigator of the Panoptic study and is the principal investigator of the Altitude study, both of which will be discussed in today's presentation. Dr. Garwood practices advanced bronchoscopy at Centennial Thoracic Surgical Associates in Nashville, Tennessee, and serves as the Thoracic Oncology Medical Director in the HCA TriStar Health Division. She is also the National Physician Director for the Pulmonary Service Line for the HCA Enterprise. Dr. Garwood is an early adopter of the Notify Lung Testing Strategy, and today will share data on a cohort of lung nodule patients who received blood-based testing and have subsequent clinical follow-up. We will be leaving time at the end of the presentation for a Q&A, so please submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I will now turn it over to Dr. Silvestri for a review of today's agenda. Thank you so much, Robbie. And uh, before I get to the agenda, it's just, it's so nice to be on with uh, Susan Garwood. Uh, uh, as I get older, it's, it's just such a pleasure to see former trainees, and Susan was a trainee in our program in Charleston, um, become such national, uh, uh, national leaders in the field of uh, pulmonary medicine. So great to be on with you, Susan. And uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So what we're going to talk about today is, is sort of what, what's the pretest probability of cancer and how does it fit in with biomarkers, which is sort of a new, uh, new player in the game uh, and nodule management. And how good are we as physicians at predicting cancer and pulmonary nodules? And if we are good at it, why don't we sort of use that to make medical decisions? I'll talk about the Panoptic trial, which was the first trial to look at uh, the biomarker Notify XL2 um, in, uh, in a uh, observational prospective multi-site uh, trial in the United States. And then utilizing biomarkers in the community setting will be taken on by Susan. We'll talk about some future studies and we'll answer any questions that you might have. Could you go to the next slide, please? So, you know, this is from basically from Michael Gould um, in, in the uh, nodule guidelines from the American College of Chest Physicians. And basically what it tells you is there's this intermediate range and the recommendation for intermediate range, which is a probability of cancer between five and 65% based on either the Swenson model or your own personal intuition, um, there's, there's like a need for further testing. And it's a wide range, right? 6% might be something almost always that, uh, is a low probability of cancer, but all the way up to 65%. And in that group, the, the guidelines recommend PET scan or biopsy. Um, most of the time, you have to go on to another test after that. And so what would, what would be uh, a good, where would a, uh, a biomarker best fit? Next, uh, hit the next bar. So a rule out biomarker, what it would do is push people into observation. Um, next bar, please. So the patient moves to surveillance. And your goal as a pulmonologist, in my view, is to try to get people out of that middle group into a more definitive group. Next slide, please. And then a rule in biomarker, if you had one, um, would push people, next slide, right to surgical resection so you didn't delay surgery in patients who needed it. And that's really the crux of what we need as physicians to do is move people in one direction to either observation when they don't have cancer or into surgical resection when they do. Next slide, please. And so um, physicians uh, actually are very good at this. And our group uh, led by Nicole Tanner, um, uh, we did a, a comparison of physician estimates of pretest probability against va validated nodule malignancy prediction calculators, such as the VA model and the Swenson or, or Mayo model. Um, and we then determined how often guideline recommended diagnostic testing was used based on that uh, probability of cancer. We looked at 337 patients. And I wanna to go to the next slide uh, quickly and basically show you that that solid line that you see at the top is actually physician's intuition. We asked them, what, what, what do you think, you know, in 10% 10, uh, in 10, uh, percent increments, uh, how close are you at predicting whether a nodule is benign or malignant? We're actually better 
uh, MDs with an area under the curve of 0.84 or 85 uh, are better than either the Mayo model or the V8 model at predicting cancer. Unfortunately, I don't know that that makes them confident enough to act on their intuition. So sometimes, even though they know what it is, they, I, I, won't, I don't want to say do the wrong thing, but they do something outside of guideline directed care. They uh, over uh, biopsy in patients without cancer uh, and sometimes don't biopsy or move to surgery in patients with cancer. And so even though I think we're very good at predicting this, we're not as good as taking it that one extra step uh, to acting on it appropriately. And that's why I think a biomarker can help. And one of the things I've sort of been creating in my own mind around this concept is physician confidence, right? If you had one more thing that can make you a little bit more confident that you're doing the right thing for your patient or that you're not worried you're missing something, that might be helpful. So a biomarker might be able to help there. Next slide, please. And so this is the uh, 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 publication in CHESS of a 33 site uh, 685 patient trial um, with some really, really good people involved from all across the United States. Um, and I was lucky enough to lead that trial. And this was patients older than 40 with nodules between eight uh, millimeters and 30 uh, millimeters. After uh, three centimeters, it's no longer a nodule, it's a mass. And the method was that we uh, used a biomarker which included two plasma proteins, LG3BP and C163A. One is more of a protective protein and one's more like sort of cancer causing protein, if you will, were integrated with a clinical prediction model. So a few things that we took from the Swenson model um, in this integrated classifier, as we call it. Um, and then we had clinicians assessment of the nodule pretest probability of malignancy. And that was provided at enrollment. If you go to the next slide, please. And the results of that trial were pretty interesting. In those that had a moderate to low, so less than a 50% or equal to 50% pretest probability of cancer, the first thing I would have you note, and this is important in your own practice, is the prevalence of cancer was about 16%. Um, and the integrated classifier had a really good sensitivity of 97%, not a great specificity, but remember, it's a rule out biomarker. If you wanted a rule in biomarker, you'd want something very specific. Um, you wouldn't care as much about sensitivity. I would love something that has characteristics of both, and hopefully we'll get there someday. Um, the negative predictive value was 98% in distinguishing benign uh, from malignant nodules. Now, we never got the results during that trial of the, uh, of the uh, blood test. We drew the blood test, and then we did whatever we would do in the management of our own patients. But had we, res had we used those results, had we gotten a result back that said, listen, this is a likely benign scenario, took it from 50% down to less than 5%, we would have avoided 40% fewer procedures, meaning 40% fewer invasive biopsies, surgeries, et cetera, uh, on benign nodules. And that's the goal, right? We don't want to operate on people with benign uh, nodules. However, we would have missed 3% of the malignant nodules would have been misclassified as benign. Now, the important thing there is we recommend this, and we will always recommend this, that it is important to put people into surveillance and make sure they come back for their surveillance. So, because you will miss a few, just like you do with PET scans. So if a PET scan uh, shows no uptake, it doesn't mean they don't have cancer. They may have a slow, slowly growing malignancy. You must follow those patients with uh, serial imaging. And if it grows, then you must direct your care accordingly. Next slide, please. And if you look at the receiver operating curves, that red grat line that you see at the top is the integrated classifier. It outperforms uh, uh, Swenson PCA, probability of cancer. So that model, it outperforms PET, it outperforms the VA model, and outperforms the uh, Mayo model. And so it really does work. Um, and, and so we took that to get to something I'll talk about later, which is future studies. Again, that was an observational trial uh, where we didn't have the results. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then, you know, we then uh, have this uh, panoptic uh, look and 47% of our patients in the panoptic study were reclassified uh, to less than 5% risk of malignancy. There's a couple other cohorts that are suggestive, we don't have final data on these cohorts, that that may be the same. In fact, if you look at the commercial, a commercial data set, we don't have outcomes for those patients, about 41% have been reclassified uh, based on the the post-test probability after the pre-test probability of cancer in, in initially. And then in this registry that we're not gonna be really talking about today, 
same number, sort of that 46% have been reclassified to less than 5%. Now, the one thing I can't tell you in there is it, how, how many might have been misclassified as cancer when they weren't. Um, but at least it's, it's reassuring that you get some net reclassification um, from your initial data set to the, to the follow-up. And if I can have the next slide, please. And um, now what I'm gonna do is turn this over um, to Susan Garwood, Dr. Susan Garwood, because um, she's going to talk about, you know, something that, you know, I don't get to talk about very often, which is what happens out in the community. Um, you know, so I'm in an academic uh, institution with lots of resources. I do see a lot of nodules and I still see plenty of patients clinically. Um, but, but she's going to tell us what her experience is with uh, this, uh, this test in the community and, and sort of the questions that have risen and the, the, the lessons she's learned by using it out in the community. Thank you so much, Gerard. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so I appreciate this is a full circle moment for me. So like Gerard said, I mean, he was my, my mentor in fellowship. So to be able to come back and um, have this conversation is, is very, um, very special to me. But also, I think what he just expressed about the difference between an academic clinical trial and then application in the community setting to me is very interesting. And so what I've asked him to do is really kind of consider this more a fireside chat. So why did you do that? What do you think about the numbers? And he's already really made me think even more um, specifically about how I can even further my clinical application with this test. And so just to take us back to the basics, remember, we really are looking at the indeterminate and low risk nodules with this test to see if we can rule out um, chances of malignancy. So we really want to focus that on the very low and the low to moderate risk. Obviously, if the patient is already determined to be high risk, um, you need to move them forward. Um, I will share a story that I had a high risk patient, looked like a cancer, patient adamantly refused. Um, I did actually end up doing a CDT test on that patient and pushed them on to surgery when that came back positive and they had a stage one cancer. So um, there are a lot of things we're thinking about how clinical application can be applied, but we wanna stick to what the evidence clearly has shown with XLT and CDT and share that on how I use that in a clinical practice. Next slide. So my clinical practice, I'm actually very uniquely blessed. I am actually only a procedure-based lung doctor now. So though Gerard taught me how to be an ICU doctor and a bronchoscopist and I learned sleep and all those things, I have evolved um, in the last six years that all I do is procedure-based practice. And I'm actually not even in a general pulmonary practice. I am in a dedicated thoracic and interventional pulmonary group. So I have two thoracic surgeons, an interventional pulmonologist, and myself as an advanced bronchoscopist. So we really have taken a very aggressive approach about nodules. We have also done that across HCA, and I've been very blessed as the physician director in pulmonary that we have built a model that scrubs and overreads every single scan within our system, inpatient, outpatient, um, and emergency room. So if they get a scan that includes any portion of the lung imaging that's over six millimeters and non-calcified and non-stable um, without a known cancer history, um, we then get those patients into our queue. So our referral queue is six millimeters or greater, even though that's smaller than what PET advises. But we know that capturing the patient is the most important thing in having that first conversation, even if it's just a conversation about the compliance of follow-up, as Gerard suspected. Everything doesn't happen with just one visit. This is a long-standing relationship. And the question is, when they come into the queue, other than using my own clinical acumen, and perhaps a PET scan, what else do we have at our disposal? And we realize that even though we're pretty good as physicians, we certainly aren't perfect. And we also know if you're anywhere um, in the country like I am, histoplasmosis can be a big masquerader. It may show up on PET scan. Um, you may have people that aren't smokers that have a difficult time thinking that they may have a malignancy. You may have um, referral bias where referring physicians don't wanna refer to you because they're afraid that you might do too many procedures like it's done with mammography. So there are a lot of challenges that I faced in, in practice. And so one of the issues clearly was, how do I risk stratify? And if we think that almost two thirds of these nodules are in the intermediate group, like Gerard said, this is a huge opportunity for us to learn more. And we believe that biomarkers is gonna be the beginning of that. So just to reorient you again, smoking status does not matter. Uh, 40 years or, or um, older, 
eight to 30 millimeters, so anything less than a mass, and then less than 65% risk. And then no previous diagnosis of cancer does ex exclude um, non-melanomatous skin cancer, so we can use it in that setting. The way my particular practice works is all I do all day long is look at nodules. So you would think hopefully that my, my clinical acumen may be a little bit higher, but I get stuck just like everybody else does. And we're really gonna talk about where I specifically use this test in my practice. When I have high risk growing nodules, pet avid, um, patients with comorbidities, I really go ahead and put this to an MDM discussion so that we can decide what is the best way to approach this patient. And then, and there's a certain subset that I really feel like I'm using this Notify test more freely. And we really wanna discuss that with you guys today and have Gerard really weigh in on um, why I kind of step back a little bit from the, the intended use group. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. So this is again, the violin plot. And again, I think though my, my patient subset here is small, I did have some patients who already had um, a pretest probability less than 5% that I did use the test in. I had a couple that were greater than 65% that I used to actually push them to act and it actually worked really well. Um, so I'm not sharing those with you today, but this shows exactly what Gerard suggested in Panoptic and what um, Oracle and perhaps this commercial cohort also showed. So of those that met this five to 65% pretest, I was able to reclassify 47% of them to a lower risk. That is a huge win for your patients, a huge win not to do a, um, a surgical procedure or a biopsy procedure of any kind and put them into watchful waiting and also to give them relief from the anxiety they have met. Um, I had a lady today who has a very small nodule. She's a never smoker. She's a young person. There's very little risk that this is a cancer. She's going to have home phlebotomy for Notify tomorrow, and hopefully that will help talk her off the ledge that surveillance is appropriate and that trying to biopsy an eight millimeter well-rounded smooth nodule in a never smoker is unlikely to be what she needs. She's in my right. cohort, She's I had 4% right. of the patients that were reclassified to higher risk. Now, remember when I started, I was the first adopter in HCA, CDT wasn't out. So some of these are a mixture of XLT plus CDT and some are XL2 alone. Gerard, any, any questions or comments about this yeah, graph before? Yeah, I, I was gonna ask you, so, so before I had this test or before you had this test, um, were you ever referred patients who were so nervous and another doctor, for example, said, no, I'm not gonna biopsy this. And then they said, they left the office and said, oh, thank you very much. And then turned up in another office um, because they insisted on biopsy. Have you experienced that? Cause I certainly have. And I, and I, I know that there have been times I've lost patients e to, uh, to do that, even if their risk was really low. And so one of the things we haven't talked about is patient preferences. You know, um, some patients don't want anything done, even if you're sure it's cancer. And then other patients want everything done um, because, for example, they have a parent or a grandparent who died of cancer. And, and if you tell them, look, even if it's only 5% risk or 3% risk, and it's so small that even if it grew a little, you'd be fine. And they said, look, I don't, I don't care, man. I want this thing out because, you know, my, you know, my grandfather died of cancer and, and you know, uh, and so I, I wonder if you get those patients and, and, and how you manage that. Yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to share some of that as we move forward. Let me go to the next slide and see it may be on there. Um, go one more slide. One more. One more. So again, I think this is what we're talking about. So in this less than 5% group here, you can see that I did biopsies on 16% of those. And the question is, why did I do that? Um, and, and one is exactly what you said. The patient anxiety was so high, the referring physician had told them this is clearly a cancer um, and we biopsied it, it was a granuloma. One of them had grown, again, the same thing. They read their report. The report says, as you know from radiology reports, this is consistent with malignancy. So we did a biopsy on them because of anxiety. And then two were positive on PET. And, and I struggle a little bit with those, right? Even though I'm in a histo belt, um, if it's not calcified or doesn't have any kind of early mineralization, you know, what do you do with the PET positive in a smoker? It's kind of hard to ignore those. Um, again, I think that's because of just the lack of confidence with this test so far is that we need bigger subsets to know, is this truly better than PET? If you have a positive PET, 
and a notify less than 5%, could you truly watch and wait? Do you avoid pet at all? I think yeah, I, thinking I, about the guidelines to me is a question. So yeah, and I mean, they're redoing uh, Michael Gould and the team, they're redoing the guidelines as we speak. And I'll be interested to see how much stock they put in pet. I, I love PET for staging lung cancer and looking for metastatic disease. I don't really love it for nodules because of all the reasons you pointed out. The false positive rate's pretty high. The false negative rate is not insignificant. Um, and, uh, you know, unless it's stone cold negative and a nodule I thought was pretty low risk to begin with, I, I, don't, get much, I don't get much help from PET. Um, and I, I will say that I... I try everything I can when they're that low of a risk to, to talk them out of doing, to talk them off the quote proverbial ledge. Yeah, like and I have Vanderbilt in my backyard, okay? So, I mean, I can tell you if I say no, I certainly had one patient who went to the ER innumerable times so he could get repeat chest CTs without his insurance questioning him. He got 10 chest CTs in less than a year because he was certain it was going to awesome. grow and he was going to die and I was not being up front with him. And of course, it was stable every time. Um, but, you know, those things you can't really help. But man, what I tell them is, would it be nice if we had more information to guide you other than just my clinical brain? And I think that's really where the test fits in, in both manners, to push people to act when they need to, but more importantly, to give them confidence when they, when they don't. So let's go back a couple slides. One more. Okay, let's go forward. Okay. So when we looked at my clinical cohort, again, I started with 60, my first 69 consecutive patients with Notify. And it was important um, to me, and I always have a hard time with yield and with people giving their results when they only have three months of data. So I really wanted to be very transparent about the way I view follow-up. And so follow-up for me, obviously I had some patients that were lost. Some people come, you never can get them back. Um, some people um, got followed by an outlying pulmonologist and didn't come back to see me or didn't get a follow-up scan for whatever reason. So I lost six people during this process, but I'm a big referral cohort. I see people in five states around me. So anywhere from Illinois to Arkansas to Georgia, um, they'll, they'll come in to see me. So they don't always travel back and, and that's okay. Um, you know, they can get follow-up elsewhere as long as it's getting done, but I don't always get the records. Um, seven patients have had the test and I don't have any follow-up as of yet, meaning they're coming back at three or six months. So we've excluded that, which leaves us with 56 patients with follow-up information, some of which I consider a final diagnosis. And a final diagnosis to me is a true negative biopsy. So something granulomatous or infectious um, that is documented to resolve or be stable at a full two years. And then, Gerard, we've talked about probably a year is enough uh, with this, but I'm, for my purposes, this regards final diagnosis, 30 of those had that in these 69 patients. I have 26 other patients who've had at least follow-up with a three or six month scan. So when we look at my outcomes, that's what we'll be talking about um, today. So next slide, please. So what does that look like? And I think this is a big piece that really struck me with Gerard. And so when we get to my results, you'll understand. Um, so who did I, as an advanced bronchoscopist who sees, you know, probably a thousand plus nodules a year, we do about 700 procedures. I do about 700 bronchoscopies a year. So you can imagine how many nodules I have to see. Um, and so a lot of those are going to be in the indeterminate range. You can see to the left that the pretest probability for the majority of my patients that I use the test in were not a full distribution of, of zero to, to 50%. Most of these were in the 25% or less and even 20% or less. So really, I call this my struggle bus area. So really the ones that I, I need a tiebreaker. I need something to help me one way or another. You can see, as you can imagine, as far as pretest probability, the size of the nodules that I'm testing, eight to 10 millimeters is the largest group. We have robotic navigational bronchoscopy now, so I can biopsy even tiny things with great accuracy. So I am getting a lot of referrals where I am encouraging them to send them. Again, the test application can't be used in between six and eight. Um, something, you know, I think we need to think about in the future. Could it be helpful? Because I can now reach six to eight millimeter nodules. But size distribution and pretest probability, because they're smaller, my prevalence of cancer in my patient population is very different than, than what Gerard saw in our panoptic trial. Next slide. So what did the results look like? 
So again, in the likely benign and reduced risk, we had 16 patients. So these true benign in the reduced risk and true benign in likely benign mean that they had a diagnostic tissue biopsy, radiographic stability, or resolution at two years. The ones that say stable, again, have radiographic imaging that shows stability during the time that I've seen them, but less than two years. In my indeterminate group, again, um, there were, where the final results were indeterminate, after follow-up, seven of them were convincingly benign, five were stable, and one of those patients had cancer. Now, they don't, the cancer patient was um, used in XL2 only. They did not have CDT uh, when I did the biopsy on this patient, and that patient had a stage one cancer, and they actually, um, that's not that one. Um, the next group is the one that had a CDT, and I did um, six patients that had high or moderate level CDT. Um, it picked up um, all the cancers uh, in that group, so two of those patients had cancer, Four of those, however, um, were benign in the CDT group. So I, inter interesting uh, to think about um, where we could use this for monitoring. Gerard, any, any comments? Yeah, I, I have here? a couple of thoughts. First is I yeah. think people need to be aware that the indeterminate means indeterminate. And you get an indeterminate back, it's as if the test never happened and you need to act on that. And I think in those violent plots that we showed, it's 47% or around 40% that you have an actionable product. So I don't think, if you order the test, I think people need to understand that, you know, it's going to be helpful maybe up to 40% of the time. Um, in, in the rest, it comes back indeterminate. And that means we still don't know. It's in that middle bucket. And then you still have to do whatever you might have done uh, before. So whether the indeterminate means that you you know, before you did the test, you were planning on biopsying, then go ahead and biopsy. Before you did the test, you were thinking more, oh, I think I'll maybe watch it, but I'll see what this test comes back. Do what you would have done before. So indeterminate means I don't have any more information than that. Second thing I'll point out is, um, you know, you mentioned before about this, you know, greater than 65%, we want to get those folks off the surgery. Isn't it interesting that um, that really means that 35% of the time you might have a benign finding. And one of the things we found in a few different trials that we've looked at where we've calculated this, the Swenson model across all groups, it turns out that that model is much more accurate on the lower end than it is on the higher end. So right. even when you think, and you mentioned this on a single patient before, even when you think that um, you have cancer and it's greater than 65% and you have by all rights can send them to surgery, um, they're still in your cohort out of the six patients. And again, these are all pretty small numbers and it's the first look at um, your site. Um, you have four that are uh, benign out of six. You have more benign in that high risk group than you ended up having cancer. And that is actually not unusual. The one other thing I'd say if we could go back one slide um, is, uh, um, yeah, we could go back that one slide. So, so one of the things that uh, Susan mentioned was this idea that now she has navigation with robotics, with uh, some people who have comb beam CT and all these other great products. And in Susan's hands, it might be right that she can get to these very small nodules. Actually, when you look at the overall literature in bronchoscopy, we are not very good at getting very small nodules. Now, you know, if you're in a very specialized cen center, that might be the case, but I, I would argue that we should be very, very careful until we have a lot more experience with these tools to go after eight to 10 millimeter nodules with bronchoscopy. I think our yield is <laughs> probably not that great. And so I would be very careful, um, uh, you know, S Susan is, doing this for a living. She's doing 700 bronchoscopies a year. Um, if you're not in the business of doing bronchoscopy every day, I would avoid trying bronchoscopy in these small nodules. I think your yield's going to be very low. And again, that might, er, might push you in one direction or another. Listen, I think transthoracic needle aspirin is complementary, not competitive um, with, uh, with this. So if you feel like you need a biopsy, I, I just want to point people towards these small nodules are so difficult to deal with. They're in this eight to 13 millimeter range. I don't think bronchoscopy is great. And, and that might have you look at using uh, the notified test in some of those patient populations with relatively low risk nodules. Okay, back two more slides forward. Go ahead. One more. 
There we go. Um, so again, you know, again, Gerard just took out my whole profession of being a bronchoscopist for a living. But um, one of my jobs as a physician director for HCA is just what he said. Um, we don't want dabblers in this space. Um, I do think there's going to be more of a service line for advanced bronchoscopy. It's projected to grow 25% over the next five years, but that's in the hands of sub sub specialists. So we really don't want dabblers or people who can't be efficient or proficient with small nodules. Technology is changing, comb beam, robotics. So it will be a sub sub specialty game. And first, you have to build the funnel of nodules and then risk stratify. And when you do have somebody, even if it's a smaller or sub two centimeter nodule where we have classically failed for years um, with only 15% um, diagnostic rate, that's horrible. Um, but things have changed and they will continue to evolve. But what we first have to do is decide. Who are we safe to watch and who needs action? If they need action, be very thoughtful about where you send that patient and what type of biopsy should be considered exactly like you said. So the purpose of this slide is to look at, again, one of the main objectives is not to act, to look at our procedures more strategically to avoid intervening when we shouldn't. So one of the things to point out is my prevalence of cancer is not like panoptic. And again, you can see because my nodule size was smaller, my pretest probability was lower. I really use this in a more finite group of patients where I personally struggled. And my prevalence of cancer in my cohort is only 5%. So we have to keep that in mind as we look at that panoptic for reference was so of the patients who had procedures in mind, 30% of them got a procedure. Again, I am an advanced bronchoscopist. They get sent to me for procedures. But if you look at the breakdown, you can see that in the less than 5% risk group, those patients got only 16% of a procedure. Two of those were PET positive, one was growing, and one was severe patient anxiety. And it's hard to argue with that. But if you look at the intermediate group, that procedure rate was 40%. And like you said, we're supposed to be using our clinical acumen. We're supposed to move forward in the same manner. But if you look at the comparison, you can see that the chances of me doing a biopsy in the indeterminate group, three and a half times as high as, as the less than 5%. So if I hadn't done the test, the question is, would I have acted more? Um, I think in my, in my opinion, I would have. Um, again, if you look at those greater than 65%, um, one of the patients declined a procedure, um, and um, the procedure rate, obviously, in the high group, as we would expect, would be substantially higher. Um, of the patients who did six patients, the biopsy was actually surgery. Um, two of them um, were stage one diagnoses. Two of them um, got surgery because of um, a high, one patient got a surgery because of a high autoantibody that turned out to be a benign finding. And so in those patients with high CDT, especially if they resected and we didn't find cancer, we have to remember that it's not a perfect test either with CDT. There may be other cross-contamination with autoantibodies with another malignancy. So we always make sure they're up to date on their mammography, their colonoscopy, maybe even a prostate exam or a PSA. So if we do have high CDT, I have a cl higher clinical um, suspicion that they may either develop a cancer in the future um, that I can't see radiographically. So I want to make sure I have that follow up with them. But I also want to consider, could there be another cancer of a different type lurking? And I think that the high group is still going to be, you know, we don't have a liquid biopsy. So we're still going to struggle. Um, one of the patients did not go to surgery that I had stage one that I diagnosed with bronchoscopy, 10 millimeters, Gerard, lower lobe, obese patient. So got it done, um, but they got SBRT. Um, and so that patient, it was very useful because the patient did not want to act, um, had a lot of comorbidities, sleep apnea, some moderate pulmonary hypertension, COPD, um, not on oxygen yet, but she was, she was close. Um, and her nodule slowly enlarged um, that her antibodies were moderately high, agreed to a bronchoscopy, she did fine, and she had a um, one centimeter adenocarcinoma that went on to SBRT. But I think, again, we have to be, the question is, can we be more convincing and really reduce those procedures even more in the less than 5%? And if, if you don't do a procedure, like Gerard said, they may shop around and find somebody else who will. So yeah, I'm going to, Let me, let me go jump ahead. back in there and say a couple things. One, Susan, um, uh, you, you, have, you have converted yourself into quite a fine surgeon. I've never heard a surgeon tell me when they didn't get a diagnosis or an answer. <laughs> they always seem to be very proud when they did. So I'm very proud of you. Um, but what I, but I, 
What I would say too is for the audience, uh, a couple of things. One is I want to keep people uh, understanding that this is in all these groups, we have relatively small numbers and that's okay. We can still make inferences from small numbers, but boy, wouldn't it be nice if we had lots of patients in each of these buckets so that we can get a better feel. And I think we will through uh, the large registry that we have uh, coming up and through the altitude trial we're going to talk about. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, you know, when you get down around that less than 5% uh, probability of cancer or even 10%, um, you know, I, I really do urge people, particularly if they have the test in hand, um, to really try to sit on their hands and not do much. I mean, get a three-month CT, um, you know, I've been at this 28 years and seen a lot of nodules. Um, I, I don't, I've never seen somebody go from a small stage one uh, cancer to widely spread metastatic disease. And so even if they grow, they're not going to get into too much trouble. And so I would do that. And, and yes, I do have patients with anxiety and, and I just try to take them through their CT, show them the risks and benefits of different procedures and, and tell them, this is what I would do if you were my mom, my sister, um, my friend, uh, this is what I would recommend to my own family member and see if we can just ratchet down that anxiety a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really it from this slide. Okay. And the only other thing we didn't, let's go to the next slide. The only other thing we didn't talk about, you asked me about as far as follow-up goes, um, in the likely benign and reduced risk results, I didn't have any false negative results to date. You know, in Panoptic, we had about a 3% miss rate. So I'm still following, um, 26, I think. Yeah, 26 of those patients. So like you said, small sample size. So we want to be careful about any conclusions you take from this, but further follow-up will be needed to confirm if they truly were benign. So more to come about that to see if I truly had any false negatives. So I think the biggest thing is, is where do we go from this? I think it's interesting to hear that the Gould's considering, you know, how do we utilize PET? Um, how do we deal with relaying data, um, you know, good evidence-based data to our patients to relieve anxiety and preference uh, with confidence? And growth on follow-up scans, again, if you have things that wax and wane, you can still have something that grows that you have a low probability, um, and it may be something infectious or inflammatory. Again, this is part of your clinical acumen. And something that we haven't mentioned is expectations from referring providers. So one of my jobs obviously is to do procedures, but what I tell providers is I'm gonna use everything at my disposal, my clinical brain, my bronchoscopic tools when I have them, but I'm gonna utilize PET scan, I'm gonna utilize Notify, and I'm gonna give that pretest probability and I'm gonna give them the post probability. And I'm gonna let them know that I'm not just a chance to cut as a chance to cure. We want to intervene on the right patients. When I have begun explaining my process to referring providers, the number of referrals I got has gone up significantly. And part of that is because I have robotics and some fancier things. Part of that is I'm dedicated to nodule. But the confidence for them to send me small things to know I'm not going to intervene too often has really been very important to have that discussion. So don't forget about the importance of communication. And then lastly, all three of our malignant nodules were diagnosed as stage one. Again, you shouldn't be doing this if you've got PET positive lymph nodes. Obviously, you want to intervene um, on, on those. But again, we're, we're happy that we're seeing more stage one disease, that the algorithms that we're talking about are really moving, um, ideally, the curve closer to early stage disease. So I found this a very useful exercise, obviously, to do with my mentor from fellowship has made it even, even better. And I think, Gerard, you're going to share with us um, what's coming next with some research as well. Yeah, so I just want to comment on a few things here. So patient anxiety and preference, you know, there's no literature out there. There's tons of patient preference-based decision-making literature, but there's no literature on how often it's the patient that changes the care plan, right? Like, and I would say 95% of the time, my patients will sort of go along with the plan, but there are a few that, like I said, they're either too anxious and they have to have something done and, or they don't want anything done no matter how much you tell them it might be cancer. But we really don't know what that number is and, and how often that occurs. Um, PET results are kind of interesting and, and I don't know that Michael Gould and their team will change the PET recommendations, but just remember we accept the false negative PET range in the, the 10 to 15% range. Um, so, so we're at 3% for Notify, you know, the confidence interval around that might be up to five or 6%. Um, so, you know, there are going to be false negatives for this test, and I think we need to expect that and, and need to understand we need to follow those patients. 
Um, and then the expectation from referring providers, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I don't, I, I'm not a, a procedure jockey. Uh, um, I, I, I do what's best for my patient. And if the referring physician, I try to talk to them and, and as, in as uh, nice a way as I possibly can, but in the end, I have to do what's right for my patients. And so at the end of the day, uh, if it's right not to do a procedure, I won't offer it. And you know, if the referring physician wants to go somewhere else with the patient, that's how we would go. So can I can look at the next slide, please. So um, there, there's a new trial, which I'm so excited about, which is the altitude trial, which is, to, you know, we took the observational trial, but again, we didn't know, we did not know um, what the clinical utility of that test was. All we knew is, you know, the physicians never had the result of the test to see if they might change their care. I mean, they might ignore the result of the test. And so this is a prospective multi-center randomized trial. Two thirds of the patients or the, physician, the, the patient's physicians will get back the result of the test and then act accordingly. So if it was likely benign, we're expecting them to follow those patients from surveillance. And one third, they'll just do whatever they did before and we'll see what the result is. And they'll have up to two years of follow-up. There's 20 to 30 sites we're enrolling currently. Really excited about that trial um, because it's the first trial of any kind in, in modern medicine that uh, uses a bio, that uses, looks at clinical utility of a biomarker. I really want you guys to stay tuned for that. It's gonna be a couple of years. And, um, we're, and by the way, in that trial, we're asking whether the patient preference switched their, uh, their mode of treatment. So we're hopefully gonna get that out of this trial as well. Next slide, please. Um, this is just the study design. I think I've described this already. And, and we are looking at the um, XLT, uh, uh, the early CDT in this trial. So people from 50 to 65%, they're just getting their blood drawn. It's an observational trial. No one's getting randomized. We are gonna just know whether uh, we have that, uh, what, what happens in that 50 to 65% range. But it's really the top half of this algorithm that we're looking at. Next slide. So I, I think one other, one other study that I didn't mention that we didn't make a slide for is the Oracle registry. And so that's, I think, close to 400 patients that we're uh, assembling. These are out in community practices in the United States. And um, we are gonna be looking at, uh, you know, how this test is used in practice. It's just a registry, so there's no randomization. Um, and again, the hope is in practice, uh, the numbers uh, look in some ways like uh, Dr. Garwood's numbers that we, we, we see how the test is being utilized in practice and, and hopefully make improvements in, in how uh, patients are being treated. So I think we'll go ahead and stop there and uh, open it up to any questions that the audience may have. Yes, thank you both very much for the informative presentation. Um, I really enjoyed hearing both of your perspectives on how you're implementing blood-based testing, especially relative to other, to other tools that you have at your disposal. Um, a reminder to the audience, if you want to submit a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll start off um, with one question for both of you. Maybe we'll start with Dr. Garwood. Um, COVID has obviously been top of mind for many people and pulmonologists. How has the pandemic impacted nodule management? And in the future, how do you see the continued impact on nodule management? Yeah, I think it's um, it's it's done some some great things and it's done some very challenging things. So the first thing it has done, obviously, is increase the number of chest images we have, and so it can be difficult because there's a lot of ground glass nodules, which we haven't really discussed. I'd love Gerard's thoughts on use of this in ground glass. Um, but lots of nodules are found, and we certainly have found cancers on those COVID scans. Um, but the issue is, is availability to come in and safety of patients to come in to be seen. And so the advent of telehealth has been one of the, the most important, I think, changes for me with nodule management, that I can see these scans, have a telehealth conversation with the patient. I can get notified done with home phlebotomy and be able to move the patient forward to the next step. We've had you know, ability to do elective procedures, again, depending on what tier you're in. If you have a suspicion for cancer, we've been able to move forward. So we only had to shut down 
um, of procedures for possible cancers uh, for a small period of time um, here in the Nashville area. But I think telehealth has been great. The ability to do this test at home and avoid a hospital has been an awesome thing for us. The amount of scans that I have to look at uh, for possible nodules has been, um, has, has been a bit exhausting, um, but I know everybody's exhausted with COVID, but it has allowed us to find some early stage cancers that were incidentally discovered. So lots of um, kind of pluses and minuses on both sides. I would just add to the, um, there's a, a, I thought, I think a pretty really good paper. Uh, Peter Mazzone's the lead author. I'm the senior author on management of uh, screening and nodule evaluation during COVID. And um, it has recommendations that, that have a lot to do with local resources. But in general, we, um, during the height of the pandemic, which is still the height of the pandemic, um, we were delaying uh, evaluations for some of these patients um, based on the pretest probability of cancer. So very low risk nodule, we might delay evaluation for a little while. We have been using telemedicine. Um, so, so absolutely. Um, and that paper lays out, I, I think, 13 or 15 scenarios. And there was consensus among 23 or so um, uh, pulmonologists, thoracic surgeons, interventional radiologists, et cetera. So you might want to take a look at that paper. Um, uh, Susan, you mentioned ground glass nodules, um, and there was a, a really good question from Nina Thomas. Nina Thomas is also a former fellow on the line today. She's at the University of Colorado um, and uh, left our lab last year, um, and she's an awesome pulmonologist. And she asks, what about part solid ground glass nodules or complete ground glass nodules? Also, you think there's a difference between application for lung cancer screening and incidentally identified nodules? So let me start with uh, the ground glass part solid and solid nodules. Panoptic was done in solid nodules. Um, and so uh, if you're going to be a purist, um, this test is supposed to be used in solid nodules. We are starting to try to assemble data in part solid or ground glass nodules. I think ground glass nodules are just a completely different beast, right? Like they're so unlikely uh, to turn out to be malignant that I'm not sure that any test would be able to help you differentiate what ground glass nodules are. They are most likely uh, uh, to be watched. Part solid nodules actually is a different uh, kettle of fish and, and part solid nodules have a, a preponderance of adenocarcinoma in them. We take those very seriously. And if you're following those radiographically, you want to measure the solid component of the nodule. And if that grows, then you should be very concerned about malignancy. Um, how notified behaves in that population, we don't have enough information yet. Screen detected versus incidentally detected nodules. Panoptic was done in incidentally detected nodules. Um, and the altitude trial, uh, we went back and forth, uh, the, the, this, the advisory board and the scientific advisory board um, and the principal investigators in, in that trial. And uh, we are, you can, I, I think you could argue both ways, but we want to be purist. And right now that, that, is, uh, that trial is not including uh, screen detected, but hopefully over time we'll gather more information uh, in that group. So for me, uh, if you want to be a purist, it would be solid nodules in incidentally detected. Um, does that mean you could never use it in a solid nodule that was picked up on a screen? No, but uh, I'm just saying that where we know we have the most robust data is in that, uh, is in that, uh, in that cohort of patients. Thank you both. Um, Dr. Garwood, would you comment on your referral patterns and are you um, seeing patients from lung cancer screening and incidental and how do you think about notifying those two patient populations? Yeah, I, I agree with Gerard. I think, you know, to be a purist, when I approach a screening patient versus a nodule patient, you have to remember screening patients very different. This is a high risk patient. You have a high index of suspicion. It's a very specific test. We had LRADs with very specific guidelines around them. Utilization of PET there, um, again, it, very guideline specific. Um, it's, it's very different than an incidental nodule, which may occur in somebody who doesn't smoke or maybe younger, certainly doesn't have the pack years. And so, the, the pretest probability is based on which calculator you're using, right? And so if we're using the Mayo calculator, um, which is built into this test, that is in 
basically this, you know, not a high risk and not a low risk. It's kind of this intermediate. So you have to be careful about the way you apply the test. If you're going to use it in a screening patient, just know that was not the intended use. And so I think you have to go with the population differently. Have I ever done it? Yes. Um, again, I often, if I do use it in that population, it's because my patient doesn't want to act and I do think that it's cancer. So if I'm shocked and it comes back less than 5%, I don't know that I've had a screen patient I've ever used it in that's come back with a less than 5%. Um, it, it's just, I don't use it often um, in the screening population. So you have to see these very differently. As far as my practice, unfortunately, I look just like everybody else in the country where 95% of what I do is incidental and 5% is screening. We are so low on adopters, we have tried many ways um, at HCA to try to increase screening, to increase education, to make screening clinics. It's just difficult. Um, as the guidelines are encouraged to change and we're lowering pack years and lowering the age, we're really doubling down on education, but I still, 95% of my practice is incidental. Thank you for that. Um, another question, maybe we'll start with Dr. Silvestri this time around the intended use of the tests. Is there value for repeat testing if follow-up imaging of the nodule becomes concerning for possible malignancy? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, we don't have data, so I'll, I'll, let me start there. So I, I guess what you're asking, uh, Dr. Zaid, is, um, is somebody comes back and they have a likely benign scenario, so you put them into surveillance and you feel pretty good about yourself, which I would and then you follow them, and three months later, the, 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 the nodules growing or something more concerning, speculation occurs, something like that. Would I repeat the test? I guess in that scenario, as I currently see it, the answer would be no. I, I think your hand's being forced. We know that there's a small but real false negative rate. And in that, in that uh, scenario, I would probably move towards uh, being a bit more invasive. Um, it, it is a good question, and disease, what we're like we're calling disease monitoring um, is something I think a lot of people are looking at. Um, but but right now, I think if it came back uh, that the patient was concerning for cancer, I would probably move to biopsy. I agree. Okay, we got a question here around the notify CDT test. Um, what does it mean if the test comes back with no autoantibodies detected? Yeah, so for the CDT, like you said, again, this is looking to see um, autoantibodies that could suggest non-small cell lung cancer. Um, no autoantibodies means exactly that. I mean, they don't have any cir circulating autoantibodies. The um, positive predictive value of that test uh, is around 78% based on what we've seen so far. So not perfect um, by any means, but you have three levels with your CDT result. You either have no, moderate, or high level. So if there's no autoantibody seen, when you do your um, notified test currently, it will reflex if there's no autoantibodies to do the XL2 portion where you have that risk stratification. So you'll have a pre and post test no matter what. But if no autoantibodies are seen, it automatically moves to XL2. If you have a moderate or a high level of antibodies, it again will give you a post-test probability of malignancy. So still looking at, we should act if it's greater than 65%. I've certainly done CDT and it's moved me from, you know, 6% to 12%. You know, do I act on that patient? It's very difficult. I can tell you when the, I tell a patient that their antibodies came back positive, which could suggest a cancer, every single one of my patients is like, I want it out you know, and we haven't found cancer, like Gerard pointed out, we've had patients who've had benign. So everything is, is an evolution. I strongly believe in registry. I strongly believe in perspective. And so I think we have more questions to answer. Not having antibodies present for my patients is again, another sign that we don't see anything circulating that could suggest it. Is it perfect? No, it's another piece to the clinical picture. You know, I would say as opposed to, uh notify there there just isn't as much information right we have the panoptic study which is a very large prospective trial and we're going to get that information on the early cdt from uh the altitude trial the arm that's just observational in the altitude trial which will bring us up to the same kind of level of evidence that we have for panoptic so i think stay tuned uh for for that 
Thank you. And there's a question here about um, insurance coverage, and maybe I could ask it slightly differently, um, starting with you, Dr. Garwood. What, what has been your experience, um, given that you've tested now um, 60, 70 patients, what's been your experience with patient billing and coverage? Yeah, so it, it's, it's always important, especially when, when things first come out, um, that you have very frank conversations, um, you know, whether that be a, a biopsy type or a, a new test. So you want to be transparent with coverage. And so this is certainly covered um, by Medicare, certainly covered by Medicaid. If you are uninsured uh, or underinsured, um, then we do have patient assistance programs that they use. And so my experience has been very good. I have um, an explanation of benefits that I give to my patients when I do the testing. So it's very clear. I tell them if they do have something that comes from their insurance company, it usually is an explanation of benefits, meaning they're questioning the test. Um, that then can always be taken up with the Biodesics um, account um, management team. Um, I have not had any issue where the test has not been covered or if the patient has been uninsured, they've never paid more than $50 out of pocket. And I'm not certain, I think I've only had one patient that, that did that who was completely uninsured. Um, so coverage is good. Again, that's important to tell that up front. And again, patient's assistance is very strong. And then the education of the patients, it's important that they understand explanation of benefits if they have an insurer that um, may question the utility uh, of this test. But um, now that we're, we're so far into there, further into this in that first year, I've really had very few queries. And so I've not had any issues and been very pleased with the financial assistance portion of this. And Robbie, you probably know more updates for that about insurance coverage. Any, any comments from your side? No, um, it's a zero out of pocket for Medicaid and covered Medicare beneficiaries to more directly answer that question. Um, but thank you for sharing your experience more broadly with, with billing and our patient advocacy team. Um, so we've got time for just one or two more questions. Uh, one more here from the audience. You guys both uh, spoke about bronchoscopy technology and robotic bronchoscopy. Where do you see uh, notified testing fitting in with uh, robotic bronchoscopy? You know, and Gerard knows I'm a bit biased about this. I think because you have a new and fancy tool does not mean you should use it all the time. And so uh, we really want, uh, especially with new technology, that you're not overutilizing it uh, inappropriately. So you should follow the algorithm. Um, you should biopsy the patients who do have, you know, this greater than 65% or in the indeterminate and you have um, the feeling that it is cancer. Again, as far as adding new technologies, the goal of robotic bronchoscopy is clearly to address the sub two centimeter and non bronchus sign. And Gerard knows that non bronchus sign um, sub two centimeters is really the bane of our existence where we're in that somewhere between 15 and 30% and range on yield. So. Um, we really want, if you're going to go after sub two centimeter lesions, we really want it to be specialist. And I really want to make sure if I'm going to take a patient to general anesthesia for a procedure that I have good reason to do that. So if you do have a robotics program, trust me, if you are methodically going through your thought process, including notify, having those discussions with the referring providers, you will get more referrals, not less because you are using your robot when you should and not when you shouldn't because it's new. Granted, they will send lots of things to you and ask you to biopsy, but you need to have the confidence and the courage on when to say no, like Gerard said. That's when robotic bronchoscopy will shine, when we're using tools at the appropriate time for intervention. Again, I'm an advanced bronchoscopy, so I'll let Gerard uh, answer too. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we published a five-site trial um, on the safety and, and initial uh, work with the, uh, with the robot uh, in chess last year. Watched you in St. Louis, Alex Chen is leading off, the lead author on that trial. And um, it wasn't meant to look at yield, but it was around 70%, which means that 30% of the time we didn't get it. Um, and I think those are people with pretty good bronchoscopy skills. Um, what I would say is I'm not sure they're actually even connected. I think you, you, you have this spectrum of tools in your tool chest, which include um, clinical prediction models, radiomics, if you have somebody who's willing to look at vo uh, nodule volume, you have a biomarker that's commercially available that there's some pretty good data on. You have surgeons, you have CT guided biopsy, and, you know, bronchoscopy, whether it be, you know, 
robotic bronchoscopy, navigation bronchoscopy, standard bronchoscopy with fluoroscopy, peripheral ultrasound. Um, to me, it's like, where do any of these fit and when can they complement each other? So I'm, I'm happy that you're able to get a, a robot. I, I hope it works well for you and your practice um, and you get the skills needed to, to do a good job with it. I'm sure you will, Joe. Um, but, but I don't know that they're completely connected. I think you use the tools, you know, that you have available. And in that intermediate range, sometimes bronchoscopy is recommended. And it's, if, you know, it gets down to patient selection. Do you do bronchoscopy versus needle biopsy? Is it a very peripheral lesion right under the pleural surface? Well, I'm not so sure they should have a bronchoscopy. They might really benefit from a transthoracic needle biopsy. If it's a central lesion and the patient has emphysema and, you know, bronchoscopy can get to it, great, do bronchoscopy. None of that, though, um, gets at whether you should use a biomarker or any other testing. Um, the biomarker should be used when you, you know, are sort of thinking this is a lower risk nodule or 50% or less risk nodule, and maybe you don't want to do a procedure. Um, it, it, it is tough, isn't it, right? You just spent a lot of money on an incredibly expensive technology. Um, you probably have administrators at your place saying, man, we bought this thing for you. You ought to be using it all the time. And, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I always go at this with what would I do for my mom? And, I, 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 you know, I, I did love the woman. So I, 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 I feel seriously that I wouldn't do anything to harm her. Um, so <laughs> if I wouldn't take my mom for bronchoscopy, uh, whether it be robotics or any other type of bronchoscopy, I, I wouldn't do it. Um, so I think that's the, the struggle that most people in practice um, go through. And let's face it, one of the reasons we went into pulmonary medicine is we like working with our hands, either in the ICU doing lines or um, in the bronchoscopy suite or doing plural, uh, plural technology with thoracitesis. And we're good with our hands. We're kind of that crossover breed. Um, but, but I don't know that they're connected. Um, and I know that's a tough pill to swallow, um, but, but that's the way I feel about it. Thank you both for your answers. And um, that's all the time we have for today. So Dr. Silvestri, Dr. Garwood, thank you again so much for taking the time to share your experiences with the Notify testing strategy in both clinical studies and in a real world clinical setting. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in to the program this afternoon. We'll be following up with a full recording and any questions that we weren't able to address today in writing. Um, please feel free to reach out with any additional questions that you might have um, and otherwise, thanks and have a great evening, everyone.